9th, 2010 school board meeting. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I got it. <laughs> I can start reading. Okay, Alan, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, the only adjustment that I've given to you, and I, I sent it to you today, is on number 7D. Mm -hmm. uh, 7D was originally put in because that's a, the consistent way we've done it over the years. But because we re-looked at uh, uh, contracts, et cetera, we realized this did not need to be on today. So I've sent a revision to you today about that. Okay. And that's the only uh, adjustment that I know of at this point in time. I do have... Uh, Recognitions, uh, Retirements, and I do have one uh, family medical leave, which I'll read at the point in time. Okay. Um, I do believe we have some changes in, rec in recognition, don't we? Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, we have Noel here. We have the speech team. Steve, do you have people from Native American SA here? And you have the spelling bee. Yes. Okay. And also, yeah. And there's also the um, writing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, approval of school board minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have the motion. I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I move that we accept the minutes from the uh, school board meeting of January 12th, 2010. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay. Seven zero. Okay. Comments by student representatives. Start with the middle school. Hello, I'm Isabel Clark, and I'm, I'm a 7th grade representative. And I'm Emma Deneen, and I'm also a 7th grade representative. And this year we only have one swim coach, Mr. Drake, because of the budget. And as a result of this, we will not be having 6th graders on the team. Um, last Friday, we repainted the snack bar in the middle school. It is now called Cape Cafe. It has gold and maroon stripes on the sidewalls and gold and maroon polka dots on the back wall. And the school vacation is coming up. It is from February 13th until the 21st. Uh, the eighth graders hosted a variety show. It was a very big money raiser. And two weeks ago, certain kids had NWEA test for the kids who needed extra help or, want, or the kids who wanted to make sure that they were progressing. Uh, we are in danger of losing our yearbook this spring. We do not have enough volunteers. And last Friday, on a half day, kids who, who brought together 100 or more box tops had a prize of throwing a pie at Mr. Connolly. <laughs> and one school board member got to do it, too. So I shoved mine. <laughs> In the seventh grade math classes, they just received uh, brand new textbooks that were raised by Tufts We Can. And for the sports, indoor track is starting this week on Tuesdays, 6th graders only, and on Wednesdays, 7th and 8th, and on Thursdays are the meets. Last uh, Friday, there was an 8th grade only dance. And for the world language news, um, the 8th grade assessment for high school placement was given in late January. A group of 6th grade French students performed Goldilocks and the Three Bears in in French for the fourth graders. And Freddie Maldo, excuse me, Maldonado Maldo from Guatemala did a presentation in January for some of the seventh and eighth grade students, including myself, about Guatemala and the Safe Passage program. And students in the fifth and sixth grade just uh, finished up interactive simulated units, the World Cup in Spanish, fifth grade, and Le Mans in French, uh, sixth grade. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, um, and in the high school, there hasn't been uh, too much going on. Second semester started, 
and um, the winter sports are coming to an end. Both our girls and boys basketball teams are going to the playoffs this week. Um, I know it's the girls team's first time since 1996, so that's really exciting for them. Um, and everybody, I think, is looking forward to vacation. I know um, the National Honor Society hosted a dance last week, which was a big success. Everybody seemed to have a lot of fun. Um, and actually, there's been quite a bit of talk about the school budget um, around the hallways, and I've heard people actually being fairly interested in getting involved and trying to um, make sure their opinions are heard. So we're going to see if we can do something with our student council to kind of get students involved and generating ideas and maybe have like a forum at night and after school and see if we can um, get people involved. Yeah. Yeah, do you have yeah, questions? Question. Sure. Um, Julia, if you do have that forum, will you um, give enough notice that we can publicize it? And I, I mean, we'd like to be there. I yeah, think definitely. Some of us would I like think to um, be there. what I've just been talking to the members of the Senior Student Council about was maybe doing like an after school one for mm -hmm. just students that could talk, and then maybe having like a night one where kids that couldn't come to the afternoon could talk and have adults mm -hmm. and parents and um, maybe have it more of a community event. So kind of great. see if we can get parents involved and students. That would be great. And school board, of course. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I add one thing? The, uh, there are quite a few uh, young ladies who have made the, on the track, winter track team, as well as one young man, have uh, qualified for the state championships. Um, we have a very strong women's team, and uh, one of the I think at least two, excuse me, two, at least two of members of the track team, the pole vault and one long distance runner, uh, Mr. Brigham, qualified for the state. I, sorry, I can't remember the other names, but. Oh, thank you, David. Anything else? Okay. Uh, comments from the public on non agenda items? Okay. Moving on to recognition. Um, Alan? Uh, the first one we have is the state's Native American essay contest, and Steve, I think you are going to speak about that as well as the spelling bee. Uh, the information I'm going to share with you right now, if I go too fast, you can find it on my new blog. It's a scary thing, isn't it? I read in the newspaper the other day, so many people are shifting away from blogs. I'm like, no, I just got there. <laughs> but anyways, um, first of all, in the, uh, the state has held a Native American history and cultural, and cultural essay contest, and Evan Solander and Tabitha Eastman's classes in the eighth grade uh, submitted entries into that, and Devin Roberts uh, won first place for his paper entitled Native American History in Maine. And uh, Heather Chase won second place for her writing titled The Wabanaki Culture. Um, in a separate contest, Mrs. Hawks in the seventh grade, her students entered pieces into the Southern Maine Writing Project competition. It's in association with the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Um, in that writing. The personal essay contest, well, there were several different categories in the personal essay section for, and everything's involving 7th and 8th graders. Uh, Alexa Carrington won gold for her piece titled The Bereft Girl and the Coon Cat. In the persuasive writing category, Lily Jordan, who is here, right, Lily? How you doing? Stand up, take a bow for us, Lily. Uh, Lily... <laughs> We'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, she's a double winner. Uh, Lily had persuasive writing. Her piece was uh, one goal for why homework doesn't help. She may even have a copy of it right there. Steve, um, Steve I understand that she would like to share with us just a snippet of yeah. her persuasive. I uh, think. You give me just a second. I'll call you right up, and I'll finish these, and, and you're going to be coming up here anyways. Uh, the, Short story contest, uh, Hannah Preble won gold for her piece titled The Sisters. And also in the short story category, Ethan Murphy won silver for his, his piece entitled Christmas Pictures. So that takes care of the writing pieces. And then we had uh, the Cumberland County State, uh, the Cumberland County B uh, was held recently at Frank Harrison Middle School in Yarmouth. Uh, Lily Jordan, our two-time school winner, she won last year as well. 
represented us in that. I think she did fairly well. I think she came in first. So that means she'll be representing us in the state B. So uh, Lily, and you have an excerpt from your paper that you'd like to share with us? Come on up. are in school six to seven hours a day. That should be long enough for kids to learn what they need to learn without having to take school home with them. Kids who get home at three o'clock and go to bed at nine only have about three hours to themselves if you include time spent eating dinner, doing chores, and getting ready for bed. Yet many schools are taking one or two hours or even all of that time away. Even if you go by the ten minutes per grade level rule, that would still only leave one hour and 50 minutes of free time for a seventh grader like me. And that time is quickly filled with other activities, sports practices and games, practicing an instrument, playing with pets, working on projects, and much more. Clearly, homework is taking up too much time to the point where kids don't have free time anymore. By assigning homework, schools don't respect their students' right to their own lives outside of school. What right do they have to tell kids what to do with their free time? Thank you. I only have one quick question for you. Did you write that at home? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Our, our next one is some of you probably saw in the Cape Courier this article entitled Cape Student Wins Gold Key Award. Uh, Jeff Shedd, I think you're going to speak to that, and we also have the student here with us today. Well, I think you should probably come up here. Okay. <laughs> this is Noel's dad, Russ Webster. Um, so I asked uh, Richard Roethlisberger uh, to write, to, to explain to me so that I could explain to the board some more specifics about Noel's involvement in the art program and a little bit about the Gold Key program as well. So I'm just going to read to you what Richard wrote. Um, the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards is a national competition that has regional judging affiliates in each state. For the past two years, that affiliate has been Hartwood College of Art in Kennebunk. Students are encouraged to enter their strongest work in a number of categories by medium, and awards are given in the form of gold key, which is the highest, silver key, and honorable mention. Regional gold key winners will display their work this month at Hartwood, and it will then be sent to New York for national judging. Awards given at the national level are celebrated at a ceremony at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Recognition in this competition speaks well of designated students in regard to college applications, scholarship opportunities, and portfolio caliber. And then he says about Noelle, Noelle is a remarkably self-motivated art student. She has been making art since childhood, marketing herself and her wares each year at Art in the Park since age 10. As a sophomore here at Cape Elizabeth High School, she is already participating in advanced level studio classes and continues to set the standard for creativity and risk taking. She is humble, generous, and an exemplary example of an art star in the making. So I wanted to congratulate Noelle. <laughs> Anybody has any questions for Noelle? Or? What was the medium that you presented in? Oh, I did a photo that I entered in for the competition. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor being recognized. Congratulations to you and to Dad. Uh, next, we have the high school speech team state championship. I believe Jeff is going to introduce that, and then we'll go on from there. Right. Um, I want to provide just a little bit of context for the accomplishment of the speech team this year. Um, two years ago. Um, because of dwindling numbers, um, I ended up eliminating the, or proposing to eliminate, and then that was endorsed by the school board, the debate team. Um, and I came very close to recommending the elimination of speech because there were dwindling numbers there as well. 
Um, there were students who were accomplishing at a high level, but the numbers were really low for, um, for the um, support that the school board was giving that through the budget. Um, last year under Lisa Melanson, who was the coach last year, um, and this year under Richard Mullen, um, the team has grown both in numbers, as you can see here, because I was wondering when I drove into the parking lot what the big deal was <laughs> and what was going to be protested. And I'm glad to see that it was it's, uh, the speech team making its appearance known. Um, has grown both in numbers and ex expertise um, to the point that this year, just a couple weekends ago, the speech team um, uh, won the state championship. Um, and one of the things I asked Mr. Mullen, I believe this to be the case, and he confirmed for me that unlike in sports where you have Division A, do Class A, Class B, Class C, Class D, that's not done. Um, so the Cape Elizabeth High School speech team is the best team in the state because they compete against schools of all sizes. Um, I want to make a special note, um, not to look for pity or sympathy for the group, but I do want to make special note um, that the team was under an extra burden this year um, as a result of budget constraints, and I think it's important for people to recognize um, that this year the students were not only working on their craft of speaking, but they were also working on earning money as well uh, once we froze, the budget was frozen for budgetary reasons. Um, so in addition to mastering their craft, they also managed to earn $6,500 approximately uh, to pay for registration, to pay for transportation, and to pay for judges' fees. Um, so I think that gives an extra sort of um, underline or italics to their accomplishments this year. I wanted to introduce Mr. Mullen, who I think is going to have a few words, and then a, a few kids are going to be talking as well. So, Mr. Mullen. Thank you. Well, this is the cue uh, for the team to come up and stand uh, with me. Uh, here we go. Oh, we get on the buses. Uh, the buses are $2.50 per mile. But to take a trip to Bangor costs this team about 600 to $700, which all has been raised. Uh, so uh, uh, we have uh, come right ahead, uh, people. Uh, get right in. Okay, uh, good. Um, so uh, this is the team. That is about 20 of them. There are 35 students who participated uh, uh, in the program this year, and still they come knocking on my door to say, how can I be a part of this program? So it has gotten tremendous cachet in the school, brought on by the success, I think, of uh, the last two years. And we have the team here, but I want to call up two other people that I know are here. Uh, Lisa Melanson, who was uh, a central in this last year. <laughs> and David Campbell, who was sitting at the back. Uh, David, come down with us. <clears throat> Cindy Stephanus also has been with us as volunteer uh, for last year and this year. So we've put together a team of adults who work with these uh, uh, young people. I also would want to mention those people who are not here, that is the CEEF, who although we plan to put debate back into the program this year, because of the budget cut, uh, CEEF uh, was willing to switch $3,000 into this program and to hold off on debate until uh, next year. So we were into survival uh, mode this year for uh, speech. Also, uh, High School Parents Forum uh, came uh, through with us, and also the parents who are willing to uh, contribute. And we have done uh, fundraisers uh, also. So we have survived, and we're very pleased to bring uh, this uh, uh, program to you. So tonight, we think we can do this in, in, in uh, maybe three or four minutes. We did go to the state finals. There are 13 categories of speaking. We're going to show you 20 seconds of four of them. And this goes right back to the first caveman who had an idea that he'd seen the Macedon, and he was in the uh, cave, and there was a little fire burning, and he talked uh, to the group about what he had seen outside. It's eyeball to eyeball. And no matter how much technology we add into this plan of public speaking, it still uh, is about one person speaking to another person or to a group. So we're going to demonstrate that uh, to you quickly. Uh, one of the uh, categories is extemporaneous speaking. And my speaker will move out here. This is Brendan uh, uh, Stewart. Uh, he was one of the top speakers this year. Brendan, separate out here in the middle. Uh, 
I prompted him with a question. For 20 seconds, he's going to answer this question. It's on Al-Qaeda. Is Al-Qaeda so much on the move that we will never be able to track these people down? When we look at the evidence presented to us in the Christmas bombing attempt, and when we look at the movements of the Muslim cleric, Anwar al-Awlaqim, who does have ties to the al-Qaeda terrorist organization, it becomes clear that the al-Qaeda are on the move and are moving to new nations, such as Yemen. The al-Qaeda are a terrorist organization that believe in the cause and as long as there are followers of this cause, they will never truly be eradicated. So, in 20 seconds, your answer is no. No. Oh, correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> moving on to a little uh, levity uh, here in this depth of winter, uh, Thomas uh, Campbell in humorous interpretation. Here's a situation for you on an airplane. Another category and the top speaker in the state in original oratory with a speech called My Dyslexia, spelled D-Y-S-L-E-C-K-S-Y-A, uh, <laughs> is uh, our speaker in original uh, oratory. William McCarthy. William McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> Dyslexia has been called many things. A learning disability, a learning difference, a brain disorder, and even a mental retardation. But those of us who have it, consider it a gift, not a curse. For it truly is a gift. Imagine the world without the contributions of Isaac Newton, father of modern physics, or Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, or Mickey Mouse and his creator Disney, all of whom were dyslexic. Thank you. Another category is original works, and this is Kelsey Crow. This is one of the categories that we to use a lack of folder with. I'm sorry to repeat that. It is always disappointing to return to a special place from childhood and see how small it really is. My house on Bridge Street in Duluth, Minnesota was built on a hill. I'm embarrassed for my childhood self to confess that in actuality, it was barely a slope. The hill was a mountain to me. The, it cast a shadow over the street, intercepting the sun's rays, creating a halo around its peak that appeared tangible at a distance. I loved it because I could take a sled to the top of the hill and ride all the way down to the street. I was invincible. Now the top team uh, in the state in ensemble, where three students uh, work together, would you step out, uh, please, uh, uh, the ensemble uh, people? And they're going to pass to you uh, our National Forensic League program, which will show you the whole range of uh, speakers. Uh, it's quite a bit to take in in just a few minutes. Thank you very much. So this was a team uh, who performed uh, uh, the uh, play Sylvia. So let's see if we can just go through the categories here. Uh, to my right, what's your category? Storytelling. Storytelling over here. Prose. Prose. And what do we have here? Dramatic interpretation. And also oratorical declamation. declamation. And over here? Humorous interpretation. And over here? Original works. And over here? Uh, everyone's going to have to step forward. Prose and ensemble. Oh, no, you have to step forward and make the presentation <laughs> eyeball to eyeball. Okay, here we go. Pros and ensemble. Good. Come ahead. Okay, here we go. Pros and ensemble. Uh, good. Uh, move right ahead, people. I really have to have a very disciplined group with 35 people. Go ahead. Dramatic interpretation in duo. Extemporaneous. 
dramatic interpretation and ensemble. Here we go. Prose reading and ensemble. Prose reading and duo. Poetry and prose. Duo is where there are two people. <laughs> prose and original works. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Oratorical declamation and poetry. Does that take uh, the whole team? <laughs> <laughs> Ensemble and duo interpretation. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. That was Most of us have an appointment over the high school, so we have to uh, like, go over there. Thank, well, thank you, thank you for everyone, everyone for coming. Hey, Alan. Do you want to give them just a minute? So yeah. are you, do, do they need to leave? Do you want to, to leave go? right now? We'll, hold, we'll wait for just a minute so you can leave. It's emptying, it's emptying the hall. <laughs> It's our meeting filter. Is that it for uh, recognition tonight? I think it is at this point in time. Okay. Uh, moving on to communications. Alan, yes. retirements? Uh, the first one I have is retirements. Uh, we've talked several uh, months about retirements. February 15th by contract is when teachers should be letting me know if they are planning to retire. Uh, and that also means if they've done it by the 15th and we do have retirement uh, funds that we pay to them. This evening I have with me six retirements. I have another one uh, that has, uh, is, has come in, and I understand I may have a couple more, but I'm going to do the first six this evening. Uh, so if you'll uh, bear with me for just a minute, I'd like to read a little bit from each of the letters. I'm not going to read the entire letter, but uh, there's parts of them. The first one is from Nancy Murphy, who's an English teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. Uh, she said, after many fulfilling and challenging years teaching high school English at Cape Elizabeth High School, I've decided to retire. This letter is to inform you that I will indeed be retiring at the end of the school year in June 2010. She goes on to say this has been an outstanding district to work in and an ideal place to teach. I have had ongoing opportunities to grow thanks to the support and trust and respect of the administration, my wonderful colleagues and students who are eager to learn. Not every teacher enjoys such a work setting and I have been very fortunate. So my congratulations to Nancy Murphy. The second one is from Sharon Merrill, who is a guidance counselor at the high school. Again, I'll read only a portion of this, where she says, I have loved my work at Cape Elizabeth High School and have truly enjoyed my work with the Cape Elizabeth student body. However, I want to pursue my dream of developing my own private college counseling business. So our congratulations to Sharon. The next one is from Pam Vos, uh, who is a social worker between Pond Cove and the middle school. Uh, she writes that I have enjoyed my long association with Cape Elizabeth schools and I hope that I have been able to make some contribution to the school department and she has been able to do that I might add. It is hard to think of not seeing the students and my colleagues on a regular basis in the future but I do feel it is time to move on to other things. And so our congratulations to Pam. The next one is from Gary Record, who teaches math at the middle school and Gary uh, says in his if the Cape Elizabeth School Board decides to offer a retirement incentive to the retirees this year, uh, I would like to be considered for that benefit. And the reason I put that in there is because I've had that question from several different people. But he does go on to say that please know that it has been such a pleasure working for the Cape Elizabeth Schools, and I'll miss the students and staff of Cape Elizabeth Middle School tremendously. But know that there will be many more exciting opportunities in retirement. 
The next one is from Hayden Atwood, who is a librarian at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. And he writes, thank you for the opportunities for professional, uh, personal development that you have provided me over the years. I have greatly enjoyed working for the Cape Elizabeth School System and appreciate the support provided me during my tenure with the school. So congratulations to Hayden. And one that I just received today, and that is from Janice Small. Uh, she notes that how can 42 years have gone by so quickly? I feel so very fortunate to have been able to spend these years in a profession that makes a difference in the lives of so many in a school system like Cape Elizabeth. I know I'll miss teaching and all of the wonderful adults and children with whom I have worked over the years. So those are the initial six that we have received so far. And I wish all six of them the very best. Uh, we will see them again at the end of the year as we do a recognition of them. Uh, I also will add to that that I have a family uh, medical leave uh, request. Again, this is not one you have to vote on, but just for your information's sake. This is for Angela Moore, who is instructional strategist at Pond Cove Elementary School. Interestingly, she writes in this, for your knowledge, um, I have a delivery due date of Friday, uh, March 5th, uh, 2010. Uh, interestingly, Angela speeded that up a little bit, and the baby has been born. <laughs> so uh, the baby is born. What she is requesting is the uh, weeks of family medical leave that, uh, that is according to federal law. And so she will be under that. And we wish her all the best and her yeah, family. Definitely. So those are the ones that I have for this evening. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Any questions? Okay. On to nurses' office update. And next, what I would do is ask Cindy Tardiff to come up. Uh, for those of you who have not met Cindy, I hope you all have. Cindy is our new nurse this year at uh, the middle school. Uh, she has been very active both at our, in our school system through the vaccination clinic and also very active in state boards. And so I'm really pleased that she could be here tonight to speak briefly about the work of nurses in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Superintendent Hawkins. Good evening, school board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth School's nursing staff, Tadiata Green at Cape Elizabeth High School, Paula Harris at Pine Cove Elementary, and Barbara Cummings and myself. It's been an interesting, unique, and challenging year, and I've been fortunate as a new employee to be part of such a supportive, organized team effort as we faced unique health challenges this year. It's the dedicated efforts of administration, staff, volunteers, parents, students, administrators, community services, the fire department, and the community as a whole who came together to help our immunization efforts represent a model of which we can truly be proud. Yes, this is the year we'll always remember that H1N1 brought us together. <laughs> our clinic numbers, impressive as they might be, we did over 1,000 doses of seasonal influenza to students and staff, over 2,000 doses of H1N1 total, through five plus clinics, some impromptu settings, where we accommodated the needs of as many people as we could. And that continues even into tomorrow when we'll continue to administer some second doses to some no-shows at our previous clinics. So our efforts have been quite extensive. But more impressive than the numbers are the results that they're expected to show. The results that the state of Maine, schools across our state, will be applauded for across our country by some efforts of the CDC. It's my pleasure to let you know that the CDC did visit our campus in January, and they enjoyed looking at our hallways full of education for students and staff about the prevention of disease. They enjoyed looking at our records and our data that showed our massive efforts in prevention of disease in our system. And they're very interested in our data of what those results are really going to show about the evidence of the reduction of disease prevalence in our system and across the state. They really like the chocolate milk and cartons as they enjoyed a school lunch in our cafeteria. <laughs> Sweet potato fries and all the salad bar offerings that made our healthy lunches very appealing. So already we've been able to showcase our friendliness and hospitality along with our clinic efforts. It's very proud for all of us in the state of Maine. As Alan said, I do represent the school nurses on the state board with Mass Maine, um, not Massachusetts anymore, I'm in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> not in Georgia either. <laughs> now in Maine. <laughs> Family. the school nurses board and so it's very nice to keep up the collegiality and collaborative efforts of us all working together to showcase our models and see what we've done what's worked and what hasn't the impact that we're expected this will show is that the absentee rates among students and staff is at 
a very low rate compared to the rest of the country. In the state of Maine, although we heard about the prevalence of H1N1, we saw a slight rise, we saw it level off, and we never saw that high spike that they saw across the country. We had it level off, and then it immediately, within a week, dropped from 23% to 5% within a week's time. So the CDC across the state wants to look at some model programs and find out why between October 23rd when we started vaccinating students and December 5th when this drop had occurred, why did it work? Was it because of the vaccine? Did it impact classrooms? Did we have students with positive results in some classrooms where the teachers got sick or the students got sick in those particular classrooms? They really just want to know what happened so we can figure out what to do in the future. So I'm just here to let you know that we have an impact on our future. We will probably have the opportunity to help the CDC in gathering research data and helping to understand what has happened through this process. They have three phases of study that they're doing through the US CDC. The first one is going to look at the direct effect of the vaccine on the prevalence of the disease. The second study is going to look at students in specific classrooms, as I mentioned, and it's going to look at you know, the effect of how it spread, if it did, within those classrooms and within the settings those students were in. And then the third phase is going to be the models, what worked and what didn't. And they're going to promote those models nationally so that when and if another effort comes when we have to do what we call herd immunity, which is hopefully prioritizing and immunizing children first, how do we do it and what worked? So we do have the opportunity here to be a model and to contribute to the research efforts. The state is also doing research through the main CDC on the same type of things. They've had focus groups with which Paul and Harris and I already attended. They're going to have a survey monkey tool, which will be a second step of the research phase. And then they also are going to identify 12 schools across the state of Maine to come in and do a more in-depth study, um, which will require a lot more time. And it, they're really interested in how disruptive was this to our processes? <laughs> what really happened? I've kind of given you an overview of what we did. Um, we had renowned epidemiologists on campus and you know, very famous influential people in the healthcare industry. We did what we had to do. They're also going to be looking at Arkansas and Virginia, just um, so you're aware that they also chose to immunize children first in the protection of the community as a whole. But not to sugarcoat you know, how we did this with a lot of ease and success and just breezed right through it. It took a lot of hours of hard work and planning. It took dotting our I's and crossing our T's. It took holding our breath. I can't tell you how lucky we were. Our timing was impeccable, but it was really just pure luck. You know, it was just being in all the right places at all the right times. And, and there were times when we were all sitting there, and I tell you, my theme song for a while was just dance. It'll be okay. <laughs> and then I chaperoned a middle school dance, and I heard another song. Somebody call 911. <laughs> and I can remember one of the days when I was sending kids home right and left when the H1N1 seemed to be really hitting us in the midst of our vaccine efforts and the clinics running, and we're trying to send kids home and keep the sick ones out of school. I'd be up and down the hallway, and the guidance counselors and administration say, here she comes. She's going to start singing. Somebody call 911. <laughs> It's what got us through, but, but again, the reality was it was disruptive. We had to be flexible. Our lunch schedules changed. Our administrators jumped in and helped us in every way they could. And with some team efforts, I just want you to all know that we should all really be proud of our efforts and that we will be recognized across the state and nationally for what we've done. And we can look forward to the results of those studies and the influence it will have on health care across the country and across the world. So thank you for your support and our continued efforts to meet the health care needs of our district. And H1N1, obesity, asthma, diabetes, whatever it may be, please recognize that we have a team dedicated to helping our students obtain their education in the most healthy and well way that we can in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Does anybody have any questions? I just, I do have a statement. I, I would like to thank Cindy and the other two nurses for all of the work they did this year through H1N1. We uh, started having Friday meetings every Friday at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had the administrators there. We had our doctor there, uh, the nurses, et cetera. And so we made very sure that we were taking the right steps at the right moment. And it was a very valuable opportunity. I would say also, though, that I am not advertising to do this on a yearly basis because it, it takes an enormous amount of time, energy, and financial support. But I can't thank enough 
uh, Cindy's leadership in this, the other two nurses, and everyone else who worked with us to make that happen. It was a, an amazing process as I was there each day when they did it and watched everybody come in and little ones who were absolutely petrified and you came out of there with great big smiles on their face and uh, it, went, it went amazingly well. And I should say that I remember vaccinations in 1954. We've done a lot like that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the superintendent's yes. budget update. Yes. I, I am only going to spend a few minutes on the budget update at this point in time. But as you read the newspapers, and I'm sure you have been watching the articles that have been coming out in the newspapers from districts all across Maine, and particularly in Cumberland County, and the issues that we are dealing with as far as budgeting for the fiscal year 11, and also anticipating fiscal year 12. Uh, as you know, tonight you will be taking a look at some information uh, which I have shared with you before and making some decisions on the governor's curtailment for the 2010 year. Uh, I listened to uh, Dick Mullen and the students who are here tonight and of course I felt a little uncomfortable as they talked because I did have to freeze the budget this year in order to make things happen, in order to get us to the point where we, where we are now. But I did, I would also comment on the fact that during this whole process, as budgets have been frozen, uh, I have heard, I've heard several people comment on the fact that students did not get what they should have for classrooms. I would speak to the fact, and I have an example right here, purchase orders continue to come in to me. I look at every purchase order individually. I talk with the administrators. I check to see which of these are absolutely necessary for classrooms. And with those, I do continue to approve those. I don't approve everyone, but I do look at those that are absolutely necessary in order for us to maintain a solid educational program. This year, earlier in this year, uh, several members of the school board and I went to Augusta to meet with Jim Ryer, who works for the Department of Education, to get some sense of what we can expect for 2011. Uh, we came back, I think, with more insight into the process. Uh, I guess I would say at this point, luckily, what we were told isn't necessarily the way it has turned out. And so last Monday, you, not this past Monday, but the Monday before, uh, some of you saw that a uh, spreadsheet came out from the Department of Education that talked about the finances and how things were going to happen. Our original thought is that we were going to be losing approximately $1.7 million in budget. With the change, which was based on a 6% decrease in the state property valuation of Cape Elizabeth, it was also based on an increase in the ARRA stabilization money. It was also based on the average of 3% increase in property value in the state. And it was also based on the penalty formula where uh, districts in Maine that did not consolidate by law were forced to give a penalty which was given to the other districts. With that information, the, the initial loss that we thought we were going to take was much different and our loss was $40,031.24. So that, that's a major factor for us. Uh, I would say to you, it has also produced a lot of conversation across the state as people look at the Cape Elizabeth uh, money as opposed to where others are being cut with local districts, some of them losing uh, two, uh, one and two million dollars. But it is the piece of the picture that finally be, gives me some quality information about where we're going. It's not final information, but some quality information. We're also very clear in the fact that the penalty money at this point in time through the Education Committee of the Legislature is being questioned. And that may be lost again. We are waiting to see how that happens. If it is, we will, we in Cape Elizabeth will lose another $110,000. But the baseline of looking at the finances of uh, what we have lost in GPA, looking at the other factors, looking also at the amounts of money based on con contractual agreements, which are $654,000 based on energy costs that we know will probably go up in the coming year, based on some revenue changes. We are about $897,433. Uh, 
uh, if we are going to try to even uh, stay at the same rate of spending we are now. We aren't at that point. We are looking at all of the possibilities. I bring this information back to the board because those are the, that's the type of information we need to look at as I move ahead in building a superintendent's budget to be prepared to give to the board within the next few weeks. So at this point in time, uh, we have a much better picture than we thought we did, but we also have some major losses financially, and we need to look at those carefully, and we need to look at them clearly. So that is where we are at this point in time. Thank you, Alan. Does anybody have any questions? Um, so I'm, I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, what kind of guidance the board has has given you or, or can give you um, in terms of the development of the of next year's budget um, so that we so that it's clear to me that we've been clear about how you, how you, how the board would like you to be going about um, creating that budget um, maybe you can I, I will this is my fifth year here Okay. So I can talk about five years I've been here. Okay. Since I came here, when I first came here, we started with the CPIU, limitations on budget. Uh, then we moved into the losses that we're taking right now. Each year we've done it a little bit differently, but normally there have been some guidelines from the school board to say to me, this is where I'd like you to go, whether it is uh, a 2% increase or a 1% increase or a negative 1% or whatever it is, it gives me guidelines to work with administration. We at this point as administrators have been working on the budget, so we have some fairly clear ideas on where we are, but we do not have a clear idea of where the board wants us to be in my budget to you, which will therefore be the budget that you will look at and make adjustments to at that point in time. So some, some direction from the board would be appreciated. Last year, I believe uh, the board uh, did gave me an amount to go by, and we worked from that. And so I would appreciate that. If you, are, if you don't have an, an amount to give to me, then what we will work on is an amount that we think is within the parameters of what is happening within the town itself. I uh, just would like to clarify one thing, and that the CPIU is not a number that was instituted by the board, but rather right. the town council. Um, and I <clears throat> believe that um, no targets were set by the board in those years that um, Alan and the um, team came to the board with what they thought would be what was in the best interest of education in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I think that actually last year was the first year that the board actually um, instituted a target um, on its own um, and not in reaction to something that was imposed by the town council. Uh, but that, that every, year is, it, every year is a new board um, and every year can have its own uh, process. So, but I just wanted to give that as a historical background. Well, could, can I propose a, a, t a target? Tonight? It's not on the agenda. Yeah, it's not on the agenda. So we probably um, well, we, well, can probably, we can discuss, perhaps, we, we could ask, hmm, how can we do this? I mean, it is on the, it is on the agenda that the, the superintendent will give an update, so I, I think it's a legitimate to have a conversation, but I don't know whether... Well, we don't need to vote on the, the target, that, but, I, but it, it would be a way of just beginning a dialogue. We don't need to vote tonight on what, on, on, on what guidance we want to give, but we can begin to discuss. Uh, what the guidance that we might want to give. Okay. Um, is the board okay with... Um, why don't you share with what you're... Okay. Well, I, well, I would like to see a, a, a budget which makes no further cuts um, to academic programs. Um, and I think that the, this, the gap that Alan described, the $897,000 um, budget gap, is um, one which would... Um, clearly require um, substantial cuts to academic programs if we were to try to meet that gap on the uh, spending side alone. Um, and I think that we have made the, the, the cuts that the district can tolerate without um, compromising uh, our children's education. 
um, and I think that we, um, we, we should consider a, a, a budget that does not uh, erode any further the, the quality of the education that, that we're able to offer our, our the children in our community. Okay. Would anybody else like to share their thoughts? David? Um, I'm uncomfortable with targets because there's two different theories of budgeting. There's a the bubble up theory and the top down theory. One year we used a uh, bubble up theory where we asked the schools basically to say if you could get everything you thought you needed and would like, what would it look like? And I think it came out to 12 percent and I'm surprised Alan wasn't hung in effigy. But that is actually the classic way that you do a budget. You ask your people what do you want, what do you need, then we make the decisions about what we can afford, what we can't afford, and what we're going to cut and what we're going to keep. And then we send it on, the voters have the ultimate uh, approval. But to give them some direction, um, I would propose sort of um, the other method that I've, and I have to tell you, I've done this, I've had this done for me at least 100 times with colleges, with all kinds of industries that I've had to reorganize. The other way to do it is to do it in a scenario theory, where you'd have like scenario A would be whatever presumptions you want, zero tax increase, what would it do to our schools, what would be the effects, say, then a, on the other side, um, I would actually go further than John and say if uh, in a year where we have less of a uh, curtailment, that's an odd thing to say, instead of more money, we're getting less of a curtailment, uh, from the state, I would like to see how, I, how we could improve our school system, like get a curriculum coordinator, get a, a human resources person, get a, um, a talented learning program, I mean, things that we could do. But to make it simple, and then we can add and, and subtract it, there's standard ways to create scenarios. One of them would be maybe in, you have your thick fact sheet, say be at a zero change in the budget. And then you can build on it. Scenario A would be a 3% increase in budget. Scenario C would be this. Then you look at the tax impact. And you look at well, maybe a worst case scenario could be, uh, as I said, no tax increase at all. And look at what, what effect, how many people that cut, how many programs that cut. And actually list them. And then we get a chance to have real information. Okay, we don't really want to cut that program. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. We think the town can do this. We think this is an appropriate thing. And then we're, we're the ones who are, have all the pieces instead of one piece of the puzzle. So in other words, it's, it's very common to have a baseline computer data. You can start at zero, you know, and then change it with cover sheets into a, say, a 3% increase and a 6% increase and what effect that has on taxes. So we can sit here and we can try to figure out what, what do we really think we need with our schools that have been capped and quite frankly underfunded for quite a long time and what do we think our people can afford in this town in a recession. And the only way we can do this is have multiple scenarios and make our value choices based on why we were elected and see if we're successful in coming up with a path. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot more words than John but what do you expect? Thank you, David. Does anybody else like to <clears throat> say anything? No? Okay, well, so, um, Alan, how would you like us to proceed? Would you like us to put on the agenda for the workshop? Um, maybe at the Finance Committee we can, Although that's late in the month, so I'm yeah, not sure that's is. going to be very helpful. Mary, I'm sorry. It's, I seem to remember last year it was not on the agenda. When we set a target, it was not on the agenda. It was my first yeah. meeting, and I remember being a little surprised by the, the target. So I, I don't know why we were able I, to I, do it then. If I may, I think it's perfectly appropriate to ask how we want the data presented. We're not making a decision. I want that presented in a very, various ways with the impact on the schools and the impact on the town. I obviously want more detail than that. And then um, how else can I make a decision? I don't know how, I wouldn't know how to come up with three, zero, ten. I don't know what it, what it would do. And I, I think it's the job of the um, administration to present the information, the principals to present the information. And we can't have unlimited scenarios, but say three scenarios. That are, a zero, a three, and a six increase in our budget. Um, and maybe if fire in, I, I can't picture a negative, but you know, 
maybe a negative, but some three or four scenarios let's take a look at with, with the effects, both in the tax rate, the budget increase, and real life impacts of where we can improve and where we're going to get hurt in our schools. Okay. Uh, John? You say you can't picture a negative, but we're looking at a $900,000 right. negative unless we, unless we approach it differently. I, I should have rephrased that. What, we are at a negative. When I said zero, I guess maybe it's my, my personal view. Um, I think we should fund a shortfall, and that to me is sort of the minimum. But I guess to be fair, I would say a zero being a zero tax increase, which would be a significant cut. So you take a look what the significant cut would be with the zero tax increase. I would agree. I guess I want to clarify what I meant by zero. I meant by zero is we, we, we meet all our obligations and our budget doesn't uh, increases, but we don't add new programs or whatever. But I think the fair way maybe to do it is we are looking at a $900,000 shortfall. Okay, what does that mean? And, what, and that's a zero tax increase. We've got to make it all up in cuts. Okay, let's assume we have a 3% tax increase. What does that do to our shortfall? Uh, and what about a 6% tax increase? Then there's obviously there's other variables. We, there's people we can talk to. There's things that might be able to be worked out that I don't think would be appropriate to talk to here. But I think everybody has to look at this thing. Everybody has to, um, we go to every well and every source there is. And, uh, and next, year, next year's going to be worse. We also have to plan for a little bit, you know, we used up our reserves this year. So. I don't want to start repeating myself, but I thank you for the clarification. I would say 0% um, tax increase. What, what does that do to us? 3% tax increase, 6%. I don't care how, what scenarios you use or what premises, but I need to see this, say the thick budget portion is, is zero. But then we add and subtract. Oh, we, you know, we figure out what that does to us. How many positions does that cut? How many uh, programs does that cut? Um, and then we move from there. What do we, how do we make that up? Is it with a 3% tax piece, how much does that make it up? Is there other ways, that, suggestions to cut the budget? And then a 6% tax increase. Do you see what I'm, uh, what I'm, I hope I'm being clear. Uh, to me, to set a target now, with no disrespect to last year's school board, I don't know how you did it, uh, to be perfectly frank. I, I think our job is to take a look at what the effect is of what we do both in the schools and on our residents. And the only way I can do that is to see it in various scenarios of how it plays out. Then talk to people, talk to uh, Alan, talk to administrators, and figure out on my own, at least on my own conscience, what we can do. So that's my suggestion. I'm sorry. That's OK. Uh, anybody else? I'm sure you absorbed everything I said, okay. didn't you, Rebecca? Um, I, I'd just like to say that I shared John's concern that we've cut what we can cut. Um, when I look at, uh, obviously, everyone's in the same boat, and we're reading about communities all around us who are dealing with the you know, curtailments and um, these enormous budget cuts, but they have a lot more room to cut. I think, Rebecca, you pointed that out in your curtailment report, that um, they are cutting things that we cut three and four years ago. Um, and so I feel like we are down to the bare bones, so I, I would um, agree that um, a few scenarios might be helpful. Oh, about the scenarios, okay. Um, I, I, okay, I'm sorry, before I speak, does anybody else, would anybody else have to say something? I was just going to comment about uh, timing. Okay. Uh, why don't you speak and then we can talk about that because okay. we do have some timing constraints too. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, my feeling is that it's de definitely not on the agenda that we're going to be talking about targets this evening per se. So um, if the board, if, the, if there's a sense of the board, if that's the way they want to go, then we need to schedule a separate meeting to have that discussion. Um, if my, my feeling is, is that if we want to just provide some insight to Alan about what would be a, a, a good way to present information to us without deciding on what any particular number is going to be, that that maybe we can give him just as a sense of the board without a, a vote per se. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to people. If I may, I think what I was suggesting, suggesting was that was giving him some guidance 
I don't want him just to make up a budget and present it to us, then we have to ask a million questions. But scenarios are not targets. They're just what happens under certain circumstances. Right. Right. I find that I think it would be impossible for me to do my job if I didn't have those various scenarios. And then I, I think that we can agree as a board that it would be up to Alan to decide what, what, what would be the most informative type of scenarios to present to the, to the board. I, I, so that we don't have to say as a board, we want you to look at this particular issue or this particular bit. Just to say it would be helpful if we could have a couple of views on the budget um, to enable us to make informed decisions. And I would just make it worst case, middle case, best case. But again, I think that that's probably going to be up to Alan and the DLT. So um, I'm struggling here, you guys. I, I'm going to say that we are going to discuss about, the, that, that we will not discuss targets this evening. Um, and that if people have a strong desire to do so, you can contact me and, and or Alan and Kathy. And then um, if we get a sense that the majority of the board wants to do that, we will schedule a separate meeting. Um, and that Alan has heard from several board members about their um, desire to see a scenario type of presentation of the budget, um, and he can use that as perhaps some guidance from, from the board going forward. And Alan, I don't know how yeah. that... Well, I, I'm just sitting here listening very carefully to what each of you have said. My, my concern is this, is we do have a limited time sequence in order to make get the budget ready, get it to you, and then get it to the town and go through all the steps of the process. Uh, I, I understand clearly what uh, David is asking for, and I understand also what John is asking for in this process. My biggest concern is this, is that in the process of building a budget, the superintendent's budget, is that if I'm going to get some guidelines from the board, I really need to know if you're saying to me, build budget with three or four perspectives in it. I need to know that because I think one of the hardest things is going to be to build one thing and then the board decides they want something different when the whole board votes on it. And so that's a difficult piece. Our work plan right now is to spend tomorrow, uh, because we met with our administrators, to, to build uh, that initial document and, and then to move on from there. So. If we are going to look at scenarios, it would be helpful for me to know. More, the more specific you can be, the better off we will be as far as making those decisions. Because I, I would say to you, I'm looking out here at my audience of administrators and Pauline, and we have spent hours on top of hours on top of hours on top of hours trying to sort out all of the data that we have and trying to decide where we're going. So if we're going to change the process, or I, that's not a fair term. I don't want to say change the process. If we are going to look at it differently, I need some guidelines as far as we go, where we go. If the majority of the board, because I believe I have to have a majority of the board supporting where we're going, if you want us to come up with three scenarios, then that's what we can do. If you want us to come up with uh, a scenario that has no further cuts, academic programs, that's what we can do. But I just need to get some sense of what that looks like because we have been operating since December really looking at the current budget and what would it look like with, with the cut process. And every administrator has taken a look at their budgets, although they haven't written it out space by space by space, they have looked at it as a zero percent budget. And therefore, what are the things that you feel are most important for your schools to survive in these strict financial times. So, so, you know, if we change, if we're going to look at a different way of going about it, the sooner I can know, the sooner I can be, begin to build. It can be as clearly defined as you want, or it can be simply saying, I want you to give me three scenarios that give certain percentages that start at zero and go, or whatever it is, but something that we can work with. Because we are, uh, you know, I look at these people sitting out here, they, some of them had just finished meetings with me today, long meetings one more time about the budget and where we are at this point in time. Oh, Kathy. Um, I'm hearing a couple things and I just want to do some clarification if I could. First of all, um, it's not on the agenda to discuss this this evening, for the board to discuss targets, not targets, whatever. So it concerns me that, one, we haven't had time to prepare, if we have thoughts on that. Two, 
um, the public doesn't know that we might be having that discussion. The other piece that strikes me is that um, I remember last year that um, Alan at, was going through some of the same things that it sounds like you're going through now, and you at one point, and I think it was a budget meeting, a finance committee meeting, had asked the board for some guidance in terms of, you know, um, I need a, a range or something, and I remember having that discussion about a potential range that the board would be comfortable with. Um, personally, I'm not comfortable at all having this discussion this evening for the reasons that I've already stated. Um, but if we are going to have that, and if you are asking the board for some kind of guidance, then I think, and, and you're, it sounds like you're running against some short time frames, I think we need to schedule a meeting um, and post what it's about so the public knows we're having the discussion and the individual board members have some time to come up with what they would like to say at that meeting. And then we post it, we have on the agenda that we're going to maybe take a vote about something like a guidance, like a range, if that's where you would like to go, then we can do that. And if four people vote on a certain motion, a range, whatever, then you can move forward with that. Otherwise, I see it still proceeding like it has in the past, where the superintendent presents a budget to the board, and it's your, it's your budget, budget right. until we get it. And then we can have you know, various scenarios, various discussions. So I guess my question is really um, where you want to proceed and how you want to do that. But coming back, I'm not comfortable having any of that discussion this evening because I'm not prepared and it's not posted that the public would, ha would know that we were having that discussion. And, and I clearly understand what you're saying, because one of the issues that we will deal with is the fact that if I come back with two or three scenarios, I'm not sure those two or three scenarios are what you're going to want. So that it, historically, a superintendent's budget is based on what you have for finances, what you think you have for finances, but you're also looking for a bottom line. Where are you going? And what is your bottom line going to be? And I think that's, that is the issue that often will come back to you. I, David commented on the year when I came up with the 12% budget. And that 12% budget was based on some discussions we had had with the board. And as you know, I uh, was pretty clearly cast in stone because of that budget. Uh, so having a direction is important. I recognize the fact that many of you look at this and look at the community and where we're going and where you want to go. So the picture is, do you want the superintendent to come up with a budget based on a scenario that we think is a probable one? Or do you want us to, do you want to play a role in what I'm using as baseline figures to get to that superintendent's budget to give to you? John. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying loud and clear, and, and, but I'm not sure how the administration can um, make a budget. I think what you said was you would make a budget based on the funding that you thought would be available when, you know, what we were really confronted as a community with a, with a problem of, um, in terms of this gap, which is close to a million dollars. Um, and th I think the community needs to be presented with an opportunity to seek a solution that involves bringing all the major stakeholders to the table. Um, that means the administration, the district staff, um, and the taxpayers um, to work out a, a, a solution that involves um, everybody sharing some of the burden of maintaining um, our current academic standard. Uh, and I, I don't know how you could you can anticipate um, how the community might be willing um, to, to contribute to sharing that burden. Um, it was minor, I, I guess, without, you know, without some guidance from, from the board, which you know, is really is answerable to that community in our, in, our, in our capacity as elected officials. Mary, you had your hand up. Um, it was similar. I mean, I think my question to you, Alan, would be how do you determine what is a probable scenario? And I do feel like our input 
would be valuable in that um, as elected officials in, in helping you determine what we think is a viable scenario as well. Um, I mean, you know what the funding is, but that's a piece of the puzzle when we're looking at. Okay, Linda. I would kind of like to reiterate some of Kathy's thoughts that, again, I mean, we're, we seem to be having a lot of discussion here. We seem to have a, a lot of good ideas floating around the table, which is telling me that we need to carry this discussion on amongst ourselves in a meeting as, as a posted meeting so that we can get the input that we need. Also give us as individuals time to formulate how we would like to see this process go forward. Um, but again, you know, where it wasn't on the agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. I too would, I think, our best route at this point in time, considering everyone's opinion, that we really do need to schedule a meeting to have this discussion. David? I think whether it's on the agenda or not is irrelevant. What he comes up with and presents us with no guidance is not on the agenda. For us to give him some guidance, non-binding guidance, what we'd like to have for information is absolutely appropriate, if not fundamentally required of a board. To expect an administrator to simply generate a budget without any guidance from the, the governing body responsible to the stakeholders, which is the shareholders, is contrary to every business principle I've ever heard of. We need to give some general guidance. It, the fact that it's not on the agenda is irrelevant because we're not sending anything in stone. We're simply giving guidance to an administrator instead of letting him have unfettered discretion to come up with something we tell him, this is useless. We give him a range of possible scenarios, and who knows how we're going to decide on it, but we have possible scenarios to look at. Otherwise, we simply get a budget based on, on Alan's whatever he decides, and I'm sorry, under state law, we approve the budget. Okay. Alan may give us the information, but he doesn't approve the budget. That's our job. Thank you. David, John? Um, I, I, can I, I just propose maybe a solution. Do we have time to schedule a meeting, yeah. um, to, to, to have that meeting, and then to have that conversation publicly yeah. so that everybody's had time to prepare and then provide that guidance and inside of a time frame in which Alan can work to do his job? Yeah. So if, if, if everyone's had a chance to speak, I'd like to have a, a chance to, to say a couple things. Um, I agree that in the best um, scenario that um, scheduling, a second, a sec scheduling another meeting to discuss this would be best. And if that happens to work with the um, time frame that Alan has in mind with his um, district leadership team, then I would support that. I would like to point out, however, that last year we did have a meeting um, in a workshop format where um, a target was set without any foreknowledge to um, board members that that was what was going to happen. Um, and the world did not come to an end. It was not a pleasant experience, and I would not, I would not wish that experience on any of the other board members to show up at a meeting completely un unprepared and not expecting that conversation. So um, I will support the idea of another meeting so we don't have to go through that process um, um, for, for the board members, but at the same time, I'm very aware that we have a very tight time frame um, given what Alan has in mind with his, his um, staff and administrators. So um, I would look to Alan to say um, when he would need us to meet by in order to have enough time to prepare whatever decisions that the board comes up with. And, and just so I can just add one more piece of clarity to this, historical practice has been that the superintendent of a school system is asked to come up with a budget and works with the administration in order to set that budget. It then goes to the school board. The school board then receives the budget. I go over it with you briefly, and then you have workshops, normally two or three workshops to discuss it. Uh, so so that's, that has been the traditional way of going about it. I think what is difficult at this point in time is that we are in a very different financial time. And therefore, deciding where we want to go with that financial time is extremely important. You know, you could start, uh, as long as Rebecca doesn't hit me here, you could start with a zero-based budget. But I don't know that that's the best place to go. Uh, you could start with a 2% increase. You could start with a 2% decrease, whatever it may be. 
But the issue is, is that we need to make those decisions as quickly as possible if you feel which was done last year is that the board gives me some direction before we finalize that first budget. We have done in the past, uh, some of you remember, a couple of three years ago we did a budget which I think had four scenarios in it, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which ranged all the way from 12% uh, down. And then you looked at each one of those and made some recommendations from there and then we came up with a bottom line budget. Then as it went to the town council there was some, again some changes and we redid it one more time. So we have done those, those pieces to the puzzle. But I think we are in a very different time frame, not time frame, a very different setup of financial implications than we have ever been in my time anyway. And so knowing where we're going would be very important. I think what so many of you are saying is I don't want to get into the middle of this and find that none of the proposals or the proposal that's coming out means nothing to us. So, Alan, so how do we do it? it looking at the schedule, yeah. Do you foresee a time that the board can meet to have this conversation um, in a matter that would um, facilitate your process with um, building budget? Well, what I would say to you is this. Uh, obviously, next week is vacation week. I'm looking at this week's calendar. Uh, I'm looking at tomorrow night and uh, Thursday night. I could do a meeting, but I think that's a little early if you want public input on it. Uh, as far as I know. Do we need 48 hours? We usually need 48 hours, particularly if it's public. In, so then you go to after vacation. Um, so one of the suggestions I have is that uh, you do have a board meeting on Tuesday the 23rd, which is supposed to be a guidance presentation. The question would be, do you want to turn that into a meeting around no, it's budget. Not it's the budget. It, it's it budget. is reserved for budget. Yeah. Oh, that's right, too. That's right. That's it's right. March this is February. It's March. Yeah. Sorry, I missed a month. And it is March 23rd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It's right. So you could do it on the 23rd? Would that give you enough time, Alan? Well, I think I, I, I honestly don't have anything that we can do until we make that decision, is from what my perspective. Our plan was is that Pauline and I would work tomorrow to review the information we have, and we were going to spend vacation putting a budget together. Uh, we'll have to change that process, and that will mean also that I'll probably be coming to you to uh, cancel a few meetings, day meetings, so we can get some things, get it done very quickly at that point in time. So February 23rd is the possibility. Oh, well, that is for finance and board workshop. That's right. So is that it's acceptable to you? Okay. It is to the board. It is to me. Okay. Um, right. I would rather do it now, but I'll. I can see a consensus forming against me. Uh, I think the problem is you want the public involved and they're not here, so I think well, to. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I remember last year not being prepared at all, and, I, you know, I'd like to, sure. you know, extend that courtesy to those who are not prepared to have, you know, I mean, I, I'm not prepared now even. I mean, I can just give you my off-the-cuff mm -hmm. reaction, but I, I, I think we'd all do better if we were well prepared. If we had some so time as, as long as Alan thoughts. is comfortable with that time, then um, that's what we should, we should uh, plan it for. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. And um, I guess I should ask if there are any more questions for Alan and his uh, update. <laughs> Seeing none, we're going to move on to <laughs> new business. It was fast. Yes. Uh, 7A is consideration to approve the modern and classical languages district curriculum goals as presented to the board at its meeting on January 12, 2010. And I would like to say that um, at that meeting we did um, have a presentation by Angela Schapani, which was um, very in-depth. And then we had a follow-up workshop um, in January that discussed the current state of the um, 
curriculum areas, but um, Mary, would you like to say anything? Um, well, I'd just like to say I thought the presentation was extraordinary, and, um, and to thank the entire world language team. I think they did an amazing job explaining the curriculum um, grade three through grade 12. I think we have, um, I think we have an exemplary program. Um, and uh, you know, and I think um, for those who did not get an opportunity to see um, that workshop, we do have workshops coming up in the future, and it's an excellent example of the good work that's being done between the board and the administration and the faculty. It's a really, it's a collaborative effort, and um, as we have stated many times, um, there are in most districts curriculum coordinators that do this kind of work for the district and here in Cape Elizabeth we have um, we have our administrators and our faculty and our board rolling up their sleeves to do this work together and um, I think the world language presentation was an excellent example of how it works very well and um, just want to thank everybody who was involved in that um, and so as such um, Shall I move mm -hmm. to um, approve the modern and classical languages um, curriculum goals as presented to the board um, at its meeting on January 12th? Do I have a second? Second. Any um, discussion? Questions? Kathy? Um, the only discussion I, or question I would have is, um, or maybe just a clarification, I want to make sure that as we look at this, um, goals and so forth that it is separated out that if there is any expense associated with this I think we have that discussion um, that there's if there is any additional expense associated with these world language goals that they be looked at in terms of the overall budget versus being approved now with the expenses along with it I just want to clarify that. I think we're just approving the goals and not that um, not the entire report that you got, so it, it, it doesn't have to do with, the, um, as I understand it, um, Alan and Rebecca, you may know better, but as I understand it, we're just approving the primary learning goals and not um, budget in particular. I don't think there are any right, numbers. And I know yeah. Rebecca and I had, had that conversation. I just wanted to make sure that that was publicly yeah. stated. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks. thanks Kevin. Yeah. Okay. May uh, all those in favor? Seven zero. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Um, may I just add, and I'm sorry I didn't add this before, is that there will this will be this report will be posted as all of the other um, curriculum reports will be posted on the internet in the next few months, and I would encourage the public to go and look at those when they get the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Could I ask you. Mary a question? Um, we, we approved the goals. I'm hoping we put on the website not only the goals but the actual report yeah, that we got from the second not yep. right. Because um, I know you had a variety of suggestions in our workshop of adding to that, and I had some questions to add to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's incumbent to get these things published now, and if we have ideas and other things we want them to get into, we can do that in the future. But I do want to say for the public that. Um, it was uh, an excellent example. Uh, there was a lot of give and take. Um, I've had several emails of people who were there who were extremely complimentary of uh, the World Language Group, uh, not only in their presentation, not only in their, uh, their report, but in their willingness to debate, defend, as well as look at possible alternatives, which is what the board presented to them. So the interactive part of the board and the staff, uh, I personally thought was tremendous, especially regarding my comment about, or question about whether or not we should continue <laughs> French. Uh, I got my head handed to me, which is, quite frankly, I think a win-win. If they can defend it that well, I'm extremely pleased. If they couldn't, I would have been extremely upset. But I can't remember the name of the lady, Jeff, but. Marsha Chase. Marsha Chase, Marcia Chase. Marcia Chase. Marcia Chase. Marcia Chase. Marcia Chase. If anybody wants to watch that on tape and watch a lawyer getting taken apart for free, go, go watch it. But I, I, I thought it was Unfortunately, an, I, we don't have it on tape. <laughs> oh, shoot. In any event, I'm conceding defeat. But I, 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 I had a lot of good reports about it. I thought it was a good dialogue. I thought the board 
didn't just take whatever they said. We questioned it. They had great responses for everything. I think they both should be published. And ongoing, if we add to it, uh, maybe for a template in the future, it might be nice that as this thing evolves, to put in there questions asked by the board with answers. Add that to the template for future ones. Because this is a great process. And, mm -hmm. and people have had great insight to what our school actually does and what the money is being used for. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay, moving on to 7B, consideration to approve um, school board goals and school board district goals for 2010 as presented. Do you have a mo uh, motion? I move to accept the goals as presented. Is there a second? I second with a question. Second. Second. Thank you. Any um, discussion, questions, David? Yeah, well, if you want to correct, I'm not sure what the first sentence means. Evaluate effectiveness of technology integrators in technology in the classroom and use, in use of technology integrated in teacher evaluation. I think there's a, maybe a word or two missing there. No, actually, that's pretty much verbatim what we said. It's, 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 the, it's trying to get at um, whether or not incorporated into teacher evaluations that um, the use of technology is included. Anybody well, else, Mary? Just only a goal, quick, but um, it's not a typo. Um, on number nine, I think it's supposed to be communications committee. <laughs> what does it say? In the work, the curriculum management plan. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Communications. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Any other um, questions, comments? Okay. All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Okay, item 7C, consideration to approve board chair signing of a joint resolution on behalf of the school board. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm adding a little bit of a different language that's on here because, um, so, uh, consideration to approve board chair signing of a joint resolution seeking fair, equitable, and transparent funding of education in Maine. Um, I, I'd like to move that the board approve the board chair signing of a joint resolution on behalf of the school board um, with any non-substantive sub, non changes seeking fair, equitable, and transparent funding of education in Maine. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, questions, comments? Question. Kathy? Um, did I hear you say you were changing some of what was presented to us? Or? No, no, I was okay. changing the wording of the motion, which would allow me to sign this resolution if there were non-substantive changes. So, if like somebody, if we're, we're going to be, I'm going to be signing this with seven other district right. board chairs, yep. um, and so there may be some minor tweaks here mm -hmm. and there, and I'd like to be able to sign it without having to come back to the board. Could, okay, understood. please, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I would make one suggestion. There are a couple things in there that. I think um, it's just language changes, plus I think it's 80% of the community is not 60%. And I consider all those non-substantive. I'd be glad to give them to yeah. you. Actually, that, um, I believe uh, that wording has been changed um, by Falmouth, and it just says a substantial number of students. I assume this is going to be an evolving document, which is why I like to phrase, where you phrase the most. I'd be glad to give you my grammatical comments, but it, when you have eight, community or whatever it is, yeah. if you, you have to be given that leeway. Well, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mary? Uh, just thank you for doing this and, and joining with these other communities. I'll be interested to see you know, what sort of response I may you need to. I may need to just comment on what this actually is because I'm not yeah. sure I've described this to um, the, the board as a whole, um, or I'm sure I've described it. the board is aware of this, but maybe not the public. Um, I had a meeting with um, school board chairs from Scarborough, South Portland, Portland, Falmouth, um, Yarmouth, um, and Cumberland is part of this, was, was going to be part of it, but they were unable to attend. And the idea is that um, we get together on an informal basis to discuss um, some of the challenges that our districts are facing. Um, to share ideas, to um, possibly discuss ways that we can work together, um, and also to uh, come together and advocate on behalf of public education um, in Maine um, as a whole in the hopes that um, with a unified voice that perhaps um, it will get more notice in Augusta than if each of us were to individually uh, lobby or advocate for um, 
public education and, and funding. So this is our first um, effort as, as a group. And um, I'm, so far, I'm tremendously impressed with the caliber of the other um, school board chairs. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with them. So, any other questions or comments? So this will be delivered to whom? Well, I think the current plan is to um, send it to the Appropriations Committee, the Education Committee, the Commissioner, um, the Governor, and then our various elected officials. Okay. Could we attach it to a flame now and shoot it at the Blaine House? What? Could we? <laughs> I'm sorry to make you repeat could we, that. Could we attach person. it to a flame now and shoot it at oh. the Blaine House? Yeah, no, I'm afraid not. Any other questions or comments? Will you deliver? Will this go out maybe in a press release as well? Uh, I'm not sure, but... Um, we can hand it right over to them. Mm, yeah, I think that's the next step. First, we have to... I, I believe that we are the sixth of the seven uh, communities to approve this. So once we get the seventh, then I'm, then I'm sure we'll go into the next stage is how do we actually... Um, what we do with it. So. Okay. All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you, everyone. Okay, item 70, consideration to approve the 2009-10 budget adjustments to offset curtailment of state funds in the amount of $621,440 and the additional expenses in the amount of $318,000. Kathy? I move that we approve the 2009-2010 budget adjustments to offset curtailment of state funds in the amount of $621,440 and additional expenses in the amount of $318,000 for a total of $939,940 total. Second. I thought you just saved me money. <laughs> I did too for a second. <laughs> second. Uh, Linda seconded. Thank you, Linda. Any uh, questions or comments? Just to be clear, I would put as, um, as set forth in the document that we were presented, so it's not carte blanche, it's done according to that. According document. to the superintendent's recommendation? Correct. Kathy, is that okay? That's with fine. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I, would, John? I just wanted to, um, to, to thank Alan for uh, what I think is cautious um, fiscal management that's gotten us to the point where we could um, this year absorb this, this cut um, without, without um, cutting ap academic programs. Um, I think, I think, um, I just want to ex express appreciation for um, the care that, that the superintendent's taken to, um, with, with spending over the last several years. Um, and, um, and, and which is, which is, you know, put some funds away um, in, in, you know, in the, that undesignated category. Um, and allowed us to, to absorb the impact of this, this curtailment relatively unscathed. Thank you. John, anybody else? Okay. Ditto. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to say, Alan did a great job, but as he noted, that there, was, there is pain to this, and students did suffer, and there are some programs that, that are being cut that some of us are trying to fund through private funds, but considering what we were facing, I think it was an amazing job as well. All those in favor? Thank you, everyone. OK, item 7F, consideration to approve proposed World Affairs Council trip to Boston University Model UN. Jeff? Gretchen McNulty's daughter's birthday tonight, so that's why Gretchen is not here, and I am. Um, and she apologizes for the late for the late notice. Um, I did send Alan into office mail a signed copy of the request, so I think that he has that. Yes, this is not a trip that um, Ms. McNulty actually originally planned to take, um, and it was really a student impetus. Uh, a number of students were interested in in going to this trip, which they have done in the past. And so she assembled it to, uh, at sort of the last minute. It's a trip that does not take any school time because it's entirely during the school vacation week. Uh, it will not cost the school budget any money um, because it's being funded by the families of the students who would be going. Um, it's five students. There are, um, there are 
there is coverage for all the students in terms of chaperones, um, and I think it can be a very positive experience as these trips usually are for students. So I don't know if there's any specific questions. I know in the past, haven't they had several more students attend? I mean, this seems like a small number going to one of these trips, or is that? It, it, is a, it is a small number. I know our Brown trip had quite a few more. I'm assuming that's a matter of who's available over the February vacation when this takes place um, and what the size of the delegations are that there are space for at Boston University. I don't know that for a fact. Okay. But, well, and that was kind of my question. Is this a smaller conference? Is that the reason there's a smaller number of students going? Or were there limitations because, you know, where it is a last-minute trip? I know a lot of times they depended on a lot of fundraising to afford the opportunity to several other students. And is that the situation here? or? I can find out the, inf the answer to that, inf that question. I don't have it now. My assumption is because I believe that this is also school vacation week for Massachusetts schools as well. Um, that it is a smaller model UN um, experience for students. Um, I believe Ms. McNulty has one other that she's hoping to do in the spring, which would again be a larger one. I think that's going to be at USM. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have a, a motion? I move to approve the trip as presented. Second? Second. Okay. Any questions or um, discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Item seven G: consideration to approve Cape Elizabeth Paths budget. Kathy, um, I move that we approve Cape Elizabeth Paths Part Two budget costs for 2010 and 11 at zero percent increase. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Alan? I, I just do want to be sure we, we comment on the fact that the Part 2 budget is a zero dollars. They looked at several different possibilities and realized the situation we're in, and so they did not charge that. There is an increase, uh, which is a fairly normal increase in the Part 1 budget, and that increase is at $3,880.49. And that's the part of the budget that is an automatic budget piece of the budget every year for us to be participants in the PATS program. And we don't, um, uh, we don't control right. that particular part of the increase. That's um, not the group that we belong to. We don't vote on that. Okay. Alan, could you summarize uh, or just state what is, the what is the amount for the Part 1 budget for Cape Elizabeth? Uh, 50,122.09. Oh, okay. excuse me. I read the wrong one. 50, 000, no, I did read the right one. 50,122.09. Okay. Isn't it 46,241.60? That's this year's. Okay. We're this is for next. Oh, We're approving for next sorry. year. Right. Yeah. And that is based on an enrollment of, um, they average the enrollments out, but that's based, based on a role an enrollment of nine and a half students. <laughs> I don't know which one we cut in half, but. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, 7-0. I just missed the second on that. Who seconded that? I did. Okay. Just wanted to be sure I had that down. Okay. Um, committee reports? Is there anybody who? Um... Okay, thank you. Public comment on agenda items and school board agenda requests and announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, the meetings are listed on the website. Uh, we do have a new one that has been, well, not a new one actually, I believe. We just confirmed that at our workshop um, on February 23rd, we will be discussing uh, the approach to be taken to this year's budget process. Okay. Um, There's one it. meeting that's not mentioned there, but it is on the town calendar, and that is the legislative meeting with our legislators at the end of this month as well. Right. Um, David, I Can would I suggest that you confirm that with them, given their their um, meeting schedules. That's a good point. Done. I will. Okay. Great. May I have a, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you, everyone. Good night.